Welcome to Practicing Like a Pro. Let's go ahead and get started. It's, uh, sometimes it goes longer than, than the 50 minutes, whatever it is. I'll, I'll keep going if it goes longer than that, but I'll still give you the code words. Hopefully it's interesting enough that you would hang around for the very end of it. All right. So uh, I'm Robert Henry. I was, uh, I'm chair of the piano program here. And I'm also a graduate from Kennesaw. I graduated in 1999. And my philosophy when I was here as a student was, OK, I'm from around here. I grew up, I was born at Kennestone Hospital. I'm basically a redneck, like most of you fine folks. And uh, you know, I, didn't I didn't audition to Juilliard. I, didn't go I just stayed right here and went to Kennesaw. But my philosophy was I could create a Juilliard experience here because we have teachers that uh, taught at or were students themselves at Juilliard and they teach here. New England Conservatory. Uh, my philosophy was to have a conservatory experience here at Kennesaw because most of the time when you're working, you're working with your teacher for one hour a week and your teacher is basically guiding you, course correcting here and there for one hour and the rest of the time it's you in a practice room. And if you were in New York at Juilliard, it would still be you in a practice room. So most of your growth takes place in your practice room and it's you coaching yourself. And if you can organize uh, and be smart about how you're using that time and organizing materials and organizing your time, you can basically have a conservatory experience It doesn't matter where you are. So that's number one. Number two, um, when I graduated here, I went to grad school. And those of you who are thinking about grad school, it's a wonderful experience because you get to practice all day. I was practicing six, seven, eight hours a day. And um, when I finished my courses, I moved back down here. I started teaching at Georgia State, started teaching here in 2003. And uh, I didn't have the same amount of time as I had before. My time was reduced down to maybe 30 minutes a day. I was traveling, competing, performing, uh, starting a family, building a house. I had my own private studio I was building up. So my, my practice times became five minutes here, five minutes there. And so, but what was strange to me is I, I was learning music just as quickly, just as much music as I was learning when I was practicing eight hours. How was that possible? And I basically accidentally stumbled upon how to practice more efficiently, and that's what I'd like to share with you today. So let's get into it. First of all, three big sections here. First of all, the mindset of the professional, discipline, experience, and patience. The science of how we learn, how does our brain actually prefer to learn, and then the ideal practice session. Those are, those are three areas that we're gonna talk about today. So first of all, the mindset of the professional. Uh, First of all, list says think t 10 times and play once. That's what we're going to be doing here. Not just mindless repetition, but purposeful repetition. Goal setting drives everything. I've talked to students sometimes and I ask them if they, have they figured out their 5, 10 year, 20 year goals and many times they say no, they haven't even thought about that. That's an important component, but really when we practice, we're practicing in three months down to one week, down to one day, down to one hour, down to five minutes, down to the next 10, 15 seconds. Goal setting doesn't have to be just 20 year time periods. It can be down to what you're, what you're going to do in the very next 10 seconds. And that's so important as we go ahead. Patience, discipline, and experience. You know, Mike Tyson says, discipline is doing what you don't want to do, but doing it anyway, and doing it like you love it. Because I don't want to practice every day, and I'm sure you don't want to practice every day either. But if we're professionals, if we're going into music, we want to make a career out of being a musician, being able to support a family and have the life that we want to live, we have to have that discipline to practice every day. So take it from Mike Tyson. Strong work ethic and commitment to crafts or your projects. No room for self-indulgence or impulsiveness. What does that look like? That looks like, oh, I'm really good at this piece. I'm going to play that all the time. And I'm going to neglect all these other difficult pieces. That's self-indulgence. And you're not really going to grow if you're in your comfort zone. So you need to expand what you're doing and, and dive right into the difficult repertoire, diff difficult challenges. That's where all the growth is. Positive belief in oneself and ability to learn quickly. Years ago, 25 years ago maybe, I, uh, I decided I would learn this Scriabin etude. It was a pretty difficult etude, six pages, it was tricky. I, I took three hours to learn it. I was really proud of myself which is pretty good. And then I just happened to read the very next week that Rachmaninoff had learned that same etude in one hour. So I thought about 
how could I have done that differently? I was like, how, how is that possible? <laughs> you know, and I'm sure there was a way that he, he arrived at, at various conclusions and uh, made certain decisions faster than I was doing. So it just, it got me to the point where I was like, can I learn a piece in an hour? How much can I get accomplished in an hour? Can I memorize a piece in an hour? And that's one of the first questions I ask when an incoming student uh, walks in the door. I say, how long did it take you to learn this particular piece? And they'll say, oh, it took me three months. And I'll say, imagine it took you an hour to learn that piece. And, like, <laughs> Were you kidding? and before you know it, a couple years later, they're learning pieces in a week, in a few days, in an hour. And it can happen. But the problem is we, we have certain patterns that we get in. Uh, I can't, what's it called? There's a business term for this. I can't think what it is right now. But um, basically, whatever resources you're given to accomplish a certain goal, you're going to take all those resources. And if, like, if you give a team six months to accomplish a project and $100,000, they'll use all six months and $100,000. If you give them a week and $50,000, they'll get it done in a week and $50,000. So if you think to yourself, oh, it takes me three months to learn a piece, it's going to take you three months to learn a piece. So you need to change that mindset. Can you learn peace in an hour? Get that, uh, get that positive belief. And identify your own personal BS. <sighs> Do you have non-musical habits, poor habits that are causing you to not succeed in your music? Are you late all the time? Do you forget your materials? Or do you practice sporadically? And a lot of those things don't have anything to do with music. You'd be having a problem with that if you were uh, a nursing major. So we want to identify our own personal BS and not, not stump, make ourselves stumble. So that's first of all. <clears throat> Pavarotti, people think I'm disciplined. It's not discipline, it's devotion. And there is a great difference. All right, the science of how we learn. Let's move through this very quickly. <sighs> all right, the forgetting curve. How many of you use flashcards? I'm sure you've used flashcards when you were a kid, all right? I did, and that's how I learned my multiplication tables. Very quick. It turns out flashcards are fantastic. That's actually the, the greatest way to learn. Um, so what happens is with the flashcard, of course, you see the information. It takes you 10 seconds to figure out the answer. Then it's thrown to the back of the deck, and then it reappears, and it takes you five seconds the next time. It goes to the back, takes you two seconds the next time, and eventually it becomes a permanent memory. And that's what uh, space repetition does for you. If you hear something, if you're exposed to something, over here, let's see, let's see if my cursor is working. It's working, but you can't really see it. It's a green dot. You can't really see it. Well, I'll just point. All right. So if you, if you hear information once, or if you practice a piece once, let's say, and you don't repeat it, science says that 30 days later you will forget 90% of that material. That's called the forgetting curve. We're all susceptible to it. That's how our brains are built. Nobody's different. How can we combat that? We do spaced repetition. We make sure that on Monday we do it, on Tuesday we do the same thing, on Wednesday we do the same thing, right? So we keep that... Uh, those, pates, those plates spinning, if you will. So that's how we combat the forgetting curve. That's number one. And that's called space repetition. They've done experiments with kids with this, different classrooms. These students over here, they teach the material 15 minutes throughout the day. Start at 8 o'clock, do a test at 3 o'clock, let's say. 15 minutes, take a break. 15 minutes, take a break. 15 minutes. This group of students, they did one block of 60 minutes. Now, who do you think learned fast? Same amount of time. Still 60 minutes total. The test results are generally 30 to 40% better with these guys. Same amount of time. All they did was take breaks. Our brain loves to take breaks. That should please a lot of you. All right. So we're going to space our, our practicing out, space our pieces out. That's lesson number one. So science also, is, well, the, well, as you're learning something, that's called fast learning. There's something called consolidation, which is slow learning. So have you ever had a situation where you practice something at night, or you know, right, not before you go to bed, and you wake up the next morning and it's fixed? How is that possible? Because your brain worked on it all night. And that's called consolidation. And in fact, sleeping is the ultimate consolidation. And what's really cool about consolidation, too, is you don't even need to take a literal break. You can just go to a different activity, and your brain is still working on the previous activity. 
So in other words, you can practice this, you can practice your Mozart and then go on to Tchaikovsky. And while you're practicing Tchaikovsky, in your subconscious, your brain is still working on, on Mozart. So switching activities. This is a way we can continually practice and still do spaced repetition, because we need that. And again, that's why it's so important to get your eight hours of sleep, because consolidation is the, the ultimate slow learning. All right. Attention span. How long is the average person's attention span? Well, the average child's attention span is about seven minutes. Seven minutes. And the average adult's attention span is about 20 minutes. All right? And you might say, well, that's not true because uh, my son or my kid or my brother or my whatever, he can sit there and just play video games for three hours. Or he can, I can just put him from the television and he'll just watch, watch Lord of the Rings for three hours. How is that possible? Well, it's always changing material. If the child is playing the same video game for three hours and he's progressing through the game, it's always new and it's, it's exciting and it's gonna keep going. He's not gonna play the same level for three hours, the same exact map. He's not gonna watch the same scene for three hours. He's gonna watch different things for three hours. See the difference? So that's how we keep our attention span too. That's an important thing to do when you're scheduling how you're practicing. You may have heard of circadian rhythm that is your sleep cycle, but there's also this energy uh, that we have. Our brain can work hard, it needs to take a break. Work hard, it needs to take a break. It's called ultradian rhythm. So 90 minutes on and about 20 minutes off is what we're, our brain is optimized for. You may have heard of the Pomodoro method, or the Pomodoro technique, which is 25 minutes working, five minutes rest. And there are apps that you can download that'll help you keep track of this. They kind of just have a click going and then they have an alarm for you. And guess what, if you did the Pomodoro method three times in a row, that's 90 minutes. And that's actually what they recommend, doing the Pomodoro method three times in a row, taking a monster break, then coming back and doing it again. You get a lot accomplished that way. <clears throat> so, so far, space repetition, attention span, and old trading rhythm. Let's move ahead. Repetition, we do need to repeat things. And our goal, of course, is to walk on stage, play it correctly, perfectly the first time, because you can't warm up into a passage on stage, you have to just play it. And your goal might be in the practice session to hit home runs over and over and over and over and over. And that gives you a really good chance of walking on stage and playing it perfectly. Let's look at some, uh, some alternatives to that, what people do. If you do too many reps and you do the same thing over and over, if you repeat the same passage the same way over and over, I've seen in sometimes a student will walk in and it says repeat 100 times. Well, that's true, you do need to repeat it 100 times, but it needs to have variety. If you don't have variety, your brain shuts off, it gets bored. However, if you don't do enough, your brain doesn't get it. So it's important that we have that sweet spot. And the sweet spot is that rule in advertising called the rule of seven. So an advertiser, in advertising, they try to get information in front of your eyeballs seven times. They want you to see that ad on the billboard on the, on the side of the road seven times. And if you don't think this is true, then why do you think they change billboards all the time? The same company will come out with a new ad. Why do you think we're not doing the 1970s I want to buy the world a Coke ad anymore? Because we've already seen that. They keep making new ads because we keep getting interested in what they're gonna do next. So, this is also how you should practice. Let's say you're gonna play a passage, play it as written, you want to play it as written. Mess with the dynamics. If it says piano, play it forte. If it says legato, play it staccato. If it says play it in this octave, play it in that octave. If it says play two hands at the same time, play one hand at a time. Add variety to your practice session. Because <clears throat> our brain likes surprise. I don't know if anybody gets that anymore. Dexter, anybody? <laughs> All right. When you're practicing, you're going to make mistakes. Okay, that's part of it. Some mistakes are okay as long as you are not just living in <laughs> mistake world uh, like this. This would not be a productive practice session where you're just constantly swinging and missing and swinging and missing. It needs to be mostly perfect practicing. That way you're, uh, you're creating those positive habits. All right? And for, for God's sake, please don't do this. <laughs> and we've all done it, including myself, right? We play it over and over and over wrong. We finally get it right, and we're like, I got it. <laughs> and then we go on to the next thing. Well, your brain just practiced it nine times wrong and one time right. You have a 90% chance of 
screwing up on stage. 10% chance of getting it right on stage. Think about it. So this is why it's so important to give your brain a perfect copy over and over and over so your brain knows what to do. All right. So reviewing that, that's how we're gonna repeat, not those things at the bottom. Types of memory. What is your short-term memory? Anybody? I mentioned it earlier. Let's see how good your memory is. 10 to 15 seconds. That's how long your short-term memory is. And if you don't believe me, what did I say 30 seconds ago? Verbatim, inflection, pauses, pitch. You don't know, I don't know. <laughs> you know, nobody knows, <laughs> okay, because it's gone. So whatever we practice, it needs to be small enough to where we can repeat it over and over and loop it within that 10 or 15 second period. Don't be playing page one over and over, taking two or three minutes to get to the, from the first measure to the bottom of the page, because by the time you get there, you've already forgotten what you were doing up here. And those synapses aren't firing anymore in your brain. Stay up here, get everything firing. Practice like a DJ, the loop. <sighs> All right, so we know it's 10 to 15 seconds. If you do that over and over enough, it gets into your working memory, which is about two or three minutes and then you move into your long-term memory. <sighs> so, let's wait till the animation catches up because I forgot to hit the button. All right, boom. All right, again, the magic number seven. So we talked about the advertising thing, but also we can only keep track of about seven things in our brain at once. That's another reason why it's dumb to play from page, from, from all the whole page, because that's just too much for your brain. So you're gonna memorize or be able to think about those seven things, but everything else beyond that goes, goes away, right? So this is where chunking comes in. Okay, so here are seven things. Now think about this. We, we just naturally gravitate toward chunking things. Chunking is taking disparate things, abstract ideas, and labeling it, calling it something. So for instance, we chunk like with phone numbers. We group it with three and four, or the social security numbers or even the alphabet. We don't say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. That's how we teach it. So we know how hard it is to read phone numbers if there's no dashes in there. We like to group things. This is where theory comes in, everybody's favorite subject, right? But if you take three different things, C, E, G, those are three things, you can actually reduce it down to one thing. And then that becomes one of your seven things that you can keep track of. This is why chords in theory and harmony are so important. Because rather than just all these notes that are completely disconnected from one another, abstract, when you group them together, you can group more notes in one thought. So chunking is so important, and that's why theory is so important. And then we start to label things. Okay, that's not just a thing. It's a C major chord. We all agree on that. And then your ABCs, might, you might call that the A group and the H group and so forth. So hooking and triggering, we'll talk about triggering later. And then learning by association. We all learn the flats, the order of the flats I, this way probably, right, bead and then greatest common factor. And then learning the sharps in the reverse order, it's F, C, G, D, A, B. So learning by association. And then if you take uh, hopefully, let's see what's next. <laughs> yeah, okay, we've got a C major chord and G major chord and C major chord. How many notes are there? Nine. How many chords are there? Three. See what I mean? This is why, this is why theory is so important. So we identify these things, we label them, we begin to associate the five with the one. Association, yeah. Call it do, so, do, the solfege, go by the tonic and dominant. These names start to begin to have meaning to you. They're action words. And this becomes an authentic cadence. So not only have we taken nine things, reduced it to three, now we're reducing the whole thing to one. One thing. C major. Those Shankarian theory folks out there, it would just simply be a one chord because we haven't gone anywhere. We started with C major, we went somewhere else, we came back to C major, so it basically just cancels out to C major. Nine things down to one thing. 
So reviewing, this is basically the science of how we learn. That's a lot of it. All right, let's go on to the last section here. The ideal practice session. All right, so one of my heroes, Bruce Lee. Anybody know Bruce Lee? Not only a martial artist, a movie star, but a philosopher, philosophy major in, in college. He's an author. He invented his own martial art called Jeet Kune Do, which is a way of, of, um, of taking the best of each of the martial arts and being flexible and fluid within all that, within all of them. So he was, he was a really bright guy. And in one of his books, there's this quote, before I learned the art, a punch was just a punch and a kick just a kick. After I learned the art, or maybe during the, the learning of the art, a punch was no longer a punch and a kick no longer a kick. And now that I understand the art, a punch is just a punch and a kick is just a kick. Think about that for a moment. What he's describing here is basically the process that we learn anything. There's the honeymoon phase of learning something. I'm really excited about this. I just want to do that. And then you go there and you, you learn a lot in those first few minutes. And then you hit a wall. You hit a ceiling. And then the difficulty comes. And that's when a punch is no longer a punch. You're dissecting things and everything becomes a challenge. And then finally, at the end of it all, it becomes simple again. And a punch is just simply a punch again. And Chopin says, simplicity is the final achievement. Not complexity, simplicity. Einstein says, if you, don't, if you can't explain something simply, you don't understand it well enough. So everything needs to be going towards that, that simple zone, that third zone there of getting simple again. And if we were to overlay simple, complex, simple on top of our semester, it might look something like this, where you have month one, month two, month three. Think about where we are right now. We're going into September. So the complex time for you, for all of us, might be at the end of September, October, beginning November-ish. That's going to be the hell time for all of us, for all of you. Okay? And then, hopefully, November, things are starting to wrap up. You're starting to really come to an awareness about what you're doing. And then you have a fantastic performance at the end of all that. But complex passages take time. They take patience and they demand study. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today. We're not talking about the easy stuff, the low-hanging fruit. If, you're, if it comes naturally to you, if you can basically sight-read something or just do something naturally, where's the practice in that? Where's the growth in that? Where's the challenge in that? It's not there. So we're talking about how to work on the complex passages and hopefully get to a place where you have a performance that's very confident. Now, speaking of demanding study, Let's look at Alfred Cortot. Alfred Cortot is one of our, in the piano world, he's a famous pianist, and also he gave us the gift of these so-called student editions. So most of the time when you buy a sheet music, right, it's just what the composer wrote. But Cortot made exercises that supported each piece for us. So for instance, each of the Chopin etudes, he made, us, he made like three or four pages of, of exercises, preparatory work that helps you play. But I love this quote, and I quote it often to my students. Study not only the difficult passage, but the difficulty itself reduced to its most elementary principles. And it's in that study that we learn a lot. We, if we can figure out the passage to this, we, we learn a universal truth that can be applied to so many pieces. That's how we level up. I don't want you to go through your, your four years here and just learn new pieces. You should be upping your learning game, upping your skill in your practice room. It's not just about learning pieces. It's are you learning more efficiently? Are you learning better? And are you leveling up your performance every single semester? Each problem makes you more intelligent by Osho. I encourage you to seek out this guy. Drops lots of knowledge bombs. Here is a master class by Joyce DiDonato. I'm sure the voice people are not here, but they would love to see this. Let's take a look. Now melt.
that was not 80%. You went to the very end of that note as Mimi yeah. with... Wow. That's, that's how I see it. You felt yeah. it, yeah. yeah. We gotta go again. Bada, one more time. <laughs> so now, don't redo what you just did, because it worked. We go through the process. Guys, this is really important. Really, really important. Don't recreate what just worked. Analyze the process you went through to create that result. You go for the result, it ain't gonna work. It might, but it's luck. It's not technique. Boom. Process. So, one more time. We are buzzing here. Through all of those notes, we continue to open and we continue to go up so nothing's falling, right? Open, open, go, 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 go. That's how we get there. That's really important. So let's do one more time. Open. And bada. Open. Lots of good stuff there. So, the simple to the complex to the simple again. In the piano area, most of the time we're learning two pieces to three pieces per semester. I don't know what you guys are doing, but I assume it's basically that. And so I would encourage you to practice, first of all, all three pieces every day. Don't practice one piece here and neglect everything else for two or three weeks, because guess what? Those pieces that you neglected are going into the forgetting curve. And you, when you come back to them, you have to redo everything you just did. <laughs> so the idea is to always be working on new material and maintaining old material. And even better, I would say, is have a focus piece. Let's say you have Bach, Mozart, and Tchaikovsky. I would practice Bach mostly for a week or so, getting comfortable and familiar maybe with the Mozart and Tchaikovsky, listen to recordings and so forth, and look at the most difficult passage, begin to write down some fingerings that you need to do. But focus on a piece. Get deep with a piece, other than the skimming. Focus on it. Then, a week later, change your focus piece. Maintaining the Bach. Maintaining the Tchaikovsky. A week later, go to your Tchaikovsky. Maintain your Bach. Maintain your Mozart. And then deep dive into the Tchaikovsky. That's how I would do it. So. Again, you're constantly learning new material and maintaining old material. This is how you deal with uh, learning new material and then you have a performance coming up. And you, the performance might be old material. The performance, you have a, a competition coming up. You have to pull out something that you did a year ago. This is how you do it. <clears throat> All right, and realize that every piece itself is going to go through that simple, complicated, and then simple phase. Every piece is going to do that. The ideal hour, getting more into what's happening minute by minute now, scales. Don't neglect your scales. Scales changed my life. I mentioned this last year at the symposium. I made that commitment at age 23. I got serious at age 23. I'm going to practice an hour of scales every day, period. Doesn't matter what I do that day, if I go to Six Flags and get home at midnight, I will practice scales at midnight when I walk through the door. Whether I want to or not, 
And I made that promise to myself. Nobody made me do it. <laughs> this is my idea. And it was torturous sometimes, but I did it anyway. And that's how I developed a discipline. And that's why I was able to uh, you know, have some of the uh, successes in my career, because I developed that discipline. I had a lot of years to make up <laughs> for where I was not disciplined. So practice your scales. Let's look at Van Cliburn's quote. I don't like to practice. <laughs> Never have. Does that sound familiar? I don't like practice either sometimes. But when I do, I love that, but when I do, I don't like it, but I do it anyway. When I get started at the piano for the first 10 minutes, I play scales slowly. I've done this all my life. And of course, we all know Van Cliburn's story, winner of the Tchaikovsky competition uh, many decades ago. So we're going to do scales. After you've done your warm up scales, arpeggios, chords, whatever you're doing, you go into your first passage. Find something that you can accomplish, uh, find a passage that you can accomplish something within that five, 10 minutes. I, I made it seven minutes just based on kids' attention span, but your, your attention, you might spend 20 minutes on a piece or whatever, 25 minutes. The point is you practice passage A or piece A for that much time. Then you go on to another piece or passage. Could be the same piece. Then you go on to another one. What do you think you do now? Space repetition. You go back to A. You repeat what you did, the same passage, again. And then you do it again and again, and you keep repeating the same thing. This is how you do space repetition within an hour. And you have what's that learning snowball. Don't do this. I'm just going to practice Bach for an hour. Your brain will turn off. You will get tired. The beginning of your practice session might be very productive. At the end of it, not so much. So this is what we're going to do. Now let's look at what happens in this A section. You have to also keep in mind that your A section is also going to have the simple to the complex, to the complicated. If you're, if you're tackling something that you haven't, if, if your piece is in shambles at the end of your A, sec, of your a uh, session, you pick something too difficult. You should have discovered something about that piece. You know how Joyce DiDonato was coaching her through all those things? Joyce DiDonato was the master teacher. She already knew what the student should do. When you're practicing, you have to figure that out for yourself. And so once you figured out those triggers that you need to say to yourself to get that passage successful, get your pencil out and write it in your music. You've already figured it out. Don't make your future self waste time having to figure it out again write in the answers, write in what makes that passage successful so that you can recreate it every time. That's what he was saying. Otherwise, it's just luck. It's not technique. Technique is being able to reproduce no matter what, no matter what the situation, no matter how scared you are, no matter what the piano is, no matter what. So during that complex phase, there should be wisdom that you're gleaning from your practice session and then write it in. <clears throat> And this practice session also should have an ease to it. It should be enjoyable. If you're finding you're in Tyrannosaurus Rex mode where everything's getting locked up all the time, you need to reduce the difficulty, as Corto said, reduce the difficulty of what you're doing so that you're able to practice within flow. Practice until it flows like oil, as Mozart said. I'm sure you've heard the word flow before. I'm sure you've been in flow before. I'm sure you've driven 10 miles and had no idea how you got there. That's an example of flow. It was effortless. How did I get here? I didn't even have to think about it. Or if you play a video game that you're really good at, you can just fly through it. Or if you're a sports person, you're on fire, you're making every shot. That's an example of flow. And flow has been studied. Um, really, the, the primary person who has done most of the research on this is Michali Robert, I'm not pronouncing that. Uh, flow is being completely involved in an activity for its own sake. The ego falls away, time flies, every action, movement, and thought follows inevitably from the previous one, like playing jazz. Your whole being is involved, and you're using your skills to the utmost. That's what your practice sessions should look like. Because if you want to walk on stage and have that experience, your practice room needs to look like that experience. 
You can't have a my God experience in the practice room and then walk on stage and be like, oh, I'm a God. I can do anything I want. <laughs> you know, so you have to uh, get into that flow state in your practice session. All right, so let's go back to this. <clears throat> Notice also that Joyce DiDonato did that warm-up, and that's where that warm-up comes from, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But here is our Mozart sonata. This is a four-pager. It's a first movement of something. Now think about it. We need to have something that we can accomplish within 15, 20 minutes, and whatever we practice needs to be 10 or 15 seconds long. And it also needs to be small enough to where we can have something simple with it, learn something from it, from the complicated area, and then get to simplicity again. How much of that can we accomplish in 10 or 15 seconds? Obviously not the whole piece. Can we play the whole page in 10 or 15 seconds? No. How about this? Can you play from the beginning to there in 15 seconds? And are there more than seven things going on? You know? How much can we play in about 10 or 15 seconds? Turns out it's about this right here at tempo. If you play half tempo, it's this. That's how much you can accomplish in about 10 or 15 seconds. So when you're practicing, practice in small chunks. Don't play whole pages. Practice in small chunks. Of course, do run-throughs. That's a different thing. That's a different way. That's when you're working on the whole performance. But when it's just nuts and bolts, complicated practicing, difficult passage practicing, crunch time practicing, this is what you do. And then you might look at this and you say, well, what are the techniques involved in here? We got rotation for pianists, that's this. Alberti bass, that's the bass pattern in the left hand. And then a two-note slur, we all know what a two-note slur is. For pianists, it's, it's a technique of dropping and lifting like this. So we have kind of three techniques going on there. So I suggest taking those two minutes and doing warm-ups that support what you're about to play. We saw Joyce DiDonato do this. Remember, she kind of went, she had the singer place that in the mask where it was supposed to be. And then she began to sing. She didn't just start singing cold. She made sure that she was placed correctly. So the same way, you play something simple, some exercises that would support what you're about to practice. And it's so important that you're, that you're warm up, you're playing correctly, you're feeling good, you're in that flow state. And then if you get into your actual piece and it's not the same, you know you're doing something wrong. Then you go back to your warm up, okay, how is that supposed to feel? Okay, now can I play this passage and make it feel that way? See what I mean? So your warm ups need to support your piece. So then you go back to your piece and you basically throw the kitchen sink at it. You do your, your spaced repetition, practice within the seven minutes and 15 seconds and all that, learn by association. Think about your harmony and your theory while you're learning your, your pieces. How many notes are in that first full measure there? Eight. How many chords are there? One. As an example. And then you create the association between those chords. And eventually you put it at tempo. All right, and we talked about the 90 minutes, we, we, but I've said 60 minutes, so what do we do with the extra 30 minutes? Well, it's open-ended. We've got a free 30 minutes. We could do another passage, you could make it a D over here, right? Do another piece, but it's open-ended. You could do run-throughs, sight reading, old repertoire, you got competitions coming up, that's where you practice that stuff. Analysis, etudes, anything you want to do in that extra 90 minutes. Another thing I would encourage you to do, if you can, is not just practice in one five-hour block, even if you take a break. Try to do, if you can, it's not always possible in, in a university, in your college schedules, but try to practice in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. The same material. There again is that spaced repetition. So you do that on Monday, Think about it, you've spaced repetition in, within the practice session itself, then you take a break and you come back later and you do the same stuff, that spaced repetition, and then I would, the ne very next day, now you have this, this repertoire that was over here that was new, now it's old. So you maintain that and you add to it with new material. 
off hours, what do you do away from the instrument? It's not just for conductors. Take your music to lunch with you and analyze it while you're at lunch. I used to do this all the time. Matter of fact, when I was ridiculous, going crazy with my competition, I would wake up, study my music. Go to breakfast, put the music on the table, study my music there. Go practice, go to lunch, study my music. <laughs> Take a break, go back to the practice room with my music. Take a break, go to dinner, study my music. After dinner, go back to practice, go home, before I go to bed, look at my music again. Wake up the next day, do the exact same thing again. Just marinating your brain in what you're doing. So score study. <clears throat> Visualization is an important part too, and that's, that there's so many different topics uh, that, that this whole conversation would lead us to. But visualization, visualize your heroes playing what you're playing. How would they do it? How would they feel? How would they sound? What would their confidence level be like? Here's Emil Galel's one of my heroes. Visualize yourself in the first person doing it. And then finally visualize yourself in the third person. All the great sports stars do this. They visualize themselves playing it. And we know from science that if we visualize ourselves doing an activity, the same neurons fire. It's incredible. Just thinking about an activity fires those neurons. You don't even have to do it. So thinking about it is so important. And in record time, we made it to the end. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions or comments or insults? Anybody? Yes. I have, you know, I wanted to print it off. I, I have a, a handout that I usually do. I just didn't have time to get it done. But it has a lot of, a lot of what I've talked about here. It has that, that, uh, the graph with the five minutes and the two minutes. Now, I, can, I can actually send that to the front office and they can send it out to everybody, sure. And it's a two-pager. On the back of it, it's on the front page, it has basically the, the summary of the lecture. On the back of it, I have an example of a previous student. And um, it was basically an hour example. What, what would I have him do if he were playing in an hour? And what would I have him do if he were playing a two-hour session? I realize that a lot of this is, is uh, not always possible. It's not always possible to have exactly 90 minutes here and then do it in the morning, do it in the afternoon, all that kind of stuff. This is ideal. If I had an Olympic team that I was training, this is how I would do it. But you do your best to, to accommodate your own schedules and make this work. So sometimes you do have to just practice two hours and that's it. You get as much done as you can in two hours. But make sure you're spacing it out uh, the way you're supposed to be doing. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Uh, well, I would hope that your six or seven songs wouldn't be wouldn't be more than you can that you, than you can schedule in this kind of configuration. If it, if it gets to the point where you have too much repertoire, I mean, how good is the repertoire going to be? I mean, is it seven or eight? Little pieces, or are these gigantic pieces? I don't know. What is it? Yeah, I would, I would, the first thing you do when you get a new piece is you look through there and you find all the hard parts. What's gonna take you longer? Because the hard parts are gonna take longer to season in your hands. You can't cram difficult passages. I had a student, uh, Brandon, uh, Brandon Lau, my student, asked me a couple weeks ago, or, yeah, uh, uh, should I just work harder on, on these passages? It's not about work, it's about time. Because it just takes time to do that. You're not gonna solve your most difficult passage in your piece in one day. You're gonna incrementally learn about it and you'll finally get to the core of what it takes to make that passage successful and then you write it in. But, so that's, that's what I would do, is kind of be strategic in, in how you're approaching your piece. Difficult passages first, and start working on those. Because the thing is, if you, if you look at the easy passages, how long does it take you to learn the easy passages? You can sight read it and memorize it very quickly. So that, that's how I would do it, no matter what. I think it's the same process, it doesn't really change. Yeah. What's your advice in choosing repertoire? Advice in choosing repertoire. Um, well, I always try to have variety. 
in when, when students are playing different periods, different speeds, different modalities, not just everything major, not just everything Chopin, not just everything fast, because that will burn you out too. So you need, as you're hopping around from piece to piece practicing it, you need to, to want to switch pieces. Like you can't wait to practice this other thing because it'll be a change from what you're currently doing. So variety I think is important. It's also important for your audience because we get bored if we hear the same thing over and over too. Um, I think, you know, we find, as I direct, uh, I, I work with students and I work with, with myself obviously and I work with choirs and things and you find with, with sometimes people want to play pieces that are harder than their certain level. Uh, they love the piece so much that they want to play it no matter what and they want to struggle with it or their ego demands that they play it. They want to sing something or whatever that they're not ready to sing. I think it's important to, to recognize where we are and play pieces within that zone. And you might have a stretch piece, a long-term piece that might take a, a semester or two or would provide challenges new for you. But in general, I think you should be playing in, in a range of comfort. Right? Because you, if you never get to that simple, if you, get, if you start a piece off and it's very simple for you and then you get to where you're hitting that ceiling and you just stay there, well, guess what's going to happen? You're going to start hating life. You're going to start hating that piece. Your technique's going to go down the drain. You're going to get all stiff. And you're not flowing anymore. So if your pieces need to have, your, your capability needs to have that, that, uh, that potential to get to that simple place again. That's how I would recommend practicing pieces. Or, or, Choosing your repertoire. It's a fascinating subject, right? It's a lot of information. Any other comments? Yeah. Well, I heard everything except the very first part of it. Okay, who taught me the most about practicing efficiently? Um, I would say, first of all, the quarto editions. The quarto editions. Even if you're a violinist or whatever, I would go online and get the quarto editions. You can find them for free on MSLP. Back in my day, they were very expensive. <laughs> they were like 40 bucks per book. Now you can find them for free online. But look at the quarto editions. You'll see how a master breaks down a difficulty into the easiest thing. So, and my goal at the time, as I told you about the scales before, my goal at the time also was to learn all the 24 Chopin etudes. And my goal was to play the scales every day and play the 24 Chopin etudes every day and then go to my repertoire. And so I carried around the quarto editions with me like a Bible. And uh, I, every time I walked in the practice room, put it right, right up there on the, on the piano and worked with the quarto. And I learned how to practice that way. Um, and eventually I wanted to learn some even more difficult pieces like Romano III and I wanted to learn the Godowski etudes of the Chopin etudes, they were actually etudes of the etudes. Um, and even that didn't teach me everything, even the quarto was lacking and I kind of invented my own way, I, I, I teach my students this with, with doing something four, three, two, one, like pyramid practicing with rests, um, but I, I did a lot of experimentation with myself, but the, the main thing about that I learned was just I was forced to do it because being involved in what I was doing and teaching and traveling and all that, I was forced to start practicing efficiently and noticed that I was learning just as quickly, so I, I was uh, practicing a lot less time but still accomplishing what I needed to. Um, so there is a book that you might want to check out if you're interested in how the brain works. It's called Brain Rules. Brain Rules. Uh, it's written by uh, a psychologist, and he explains how uh, space repetition works and chunking and all that kind of stuff. And so I, I began to read a little bit uh, as well. And of course, I have a lot of years teaching teaching experience, and it's not like I'm just saying all this and it, it doesn't work. I mean, it, it does work with my students, and, and they've uh, we've had good results. Any other questions or comments? Yes, in the back. My, f my favorite, believe it or not, it's, uh, there's the 24 big ones, and then there are these three, he called them th the three new etudes, they're easier, 
uh, Trois Nouvelles Etudes, and they are, uh, there's one in A flat that is actually one of my favorite pieces ever. So if I had to, if I had one piece to play, that's usually what I sit down and play. If it's late at night, I got the lights down, it's midnight, had a glass of wine, that's usually what I play. And there's so many different ways of playing it. I've actually thought about recording that in like 15 different ways. You know, there, there are artists out there who have painted portraits or paint, done paintings on various drugs. Um, I've actually thought about that. <laughs> but I'm, not sure if the, I'm not sure if the university would support that, you know? So um, <laughs> I'm, that may be like after I retire. We'll see, we'll see what I do. But, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think that's probably my, one of my favorite pieces, the Chopin A-flat from the Trois Nouvelles Etudes. It's not the most difficult one. That's not the most challenging one. That's the very first one I learned, though. So yeah, get the Corto Etudes, study that, read, read about that. You'll see what I mean about breaking a piece down. Was there another question in the back? I thought I saw somebody else's hand, maybe not. Well, anyway, it's 2.16, it's time to go. Thank you very much, let me give you the code words. <laughs> I appreciate it. We love y'all, we appreciate you and we support you, we really do. Uh, the code words are, the composer is Bruckner. The number, coincidentally, is seven. And the month is December. Bruckner, seven, December. Bruckner is spelled B-R-U-C-K N E R. All right. Happy practicing. Bye bye. <laughs>